guys? Welcome to another episode of Behind the Helmet. I'm really excited about today's because we have Amanda Zitto on the channel. She is the person that is behind the channel as the magpie flies. All of the links for everything on her social media is going to be down in the description for you to check her out. She has a YouTube channel that if you haven't already seen it, she's done a lot of journeys by motorcycle and it's a lot of fun to watch and follow along with her as she experiences these journeys. It started with the pilgrimage and most recently she did CABDER. I kind of know that acronym. California Back Road Dirt Ad... No, Adventure doesn't start with an R. <laughs> All of the links are going to be down in the description for you to check her out. So Amanda, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into motorcycles, and what led you into starting a YouTube channel? That was a lot of questions all at once. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Amanda Zitto. Obviously, I was born and raised in Montana, a thing that I'm pretty proud of, actually. Um, I actually started riding horses before I got into motorcycles, and I moved to Portland, Oregon in 2010 for art school, and I couldn't bring my horses with me. So I decided motorcycles were probably the next best thing, right? Right. <laughs> Mechanical steeds. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They call it horsepower for a reason. What? Exactly. <laughs> so on your rides and in your channel, speaking of mechanical steeds, you've had a few different bikes over the past few years going on your journeys. Uh, the pilgrimage was on your Honda Shadow, and then later with Lazarus, which is has been a big fixture on the channel, you have the Cyborg Boyfriend with the CB500X, and more recently, you have a Triumph Tiger. From your experience, what has been the best all-around bike that's handled kind of all of the terrain and all of the curveballs that you've thrown out at the best? And I guess just in general, sort of the geographical unknowns that you've encountered. I love the Shadow because it was pretty much bulletproof. I never had an issue with it. Um, it's really, really great on really long distances. Um, it was okay on gravel roads, to be honest. It was fine. Um, Lazarus is a novelty. I probably wouldn't recommend anybody doing what I did on a 1980 Suzuki GS850, um, especially a more than 30 year old bike um, with all of the issues that I had. Um, it definitely made it an adventure for sure. I met a lot of really amazing people because I had so many issues with the bike. But I think best overall motorcycle of the ones that I have um, is probably a tie between um, the CB500X and my Tiger. Um, the Tiger is probably better for super long hauls because it handles the highway speeds a little bit better. Off-road, like the gnarly stuff, the Tiger handles a little bit better because it has the 21 front wheel and better suspension than my Honda does, but they make rally raid kits for my Honda. Um, if I had the money for it, I would totally be buying that. Just stock, uh, the Tiger probably wins overall. <laughs> It's so hard to say because I love the Honda so much. <laughs> it's almost like the Honda reliability versus the Triumph experience and it's really hard to say like which one's better because they're both good in their own way. So if you've seen any of the videos on Amanda's channel, she's done a lot of moto camping and a lot of long distance adventures. If someone were looking to get into that sort of thing as far as traveling by bike and camping and adventuring out more beyond just you know like a daily highway ride, what advice would you give them as far as maybe if they're considering what type of bike they should get or what gear they should be looking into now that you've had some experience under your belt? Honestly, I think any bike can do it. I, I think the bike that you have is the best bike to start on. Um, I personally like got Lazarus, um, the 850, as my first bike because I knew that I wanted to do a lot of long distance travel and I knew that I was going to be taking it from Portland to Montana back a lot and I wanted it to be able to survive highway speeds. Um, but honestly, like even if you have like a 250 or any or a 500 or anything like that, like just pick like a back road route to wherever you want to go, you know? Um, as far as gear, uh, Investing in a good set of saddlebags is probably my best tip, as well as um, making sure that you're investing in real, like, proper waterproofs and always bringing them, <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> the waterproofs would definitely, I could see the value in those, especially because up, and especially up there in the Pacific Northwest, it can rain a bit unpredictably. 
if anything, it's it's been like the weather here. Well, they'll they'll just kind of put out there. Oh, there's like a fifty percent chance of rain. It may or may not. We're not going to predict it. And the next thing you know, it's like downpouring, and you have no wet weather gear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are there, aside from waterproof gear, are there any particular gear items that you maybe have personally that you just cannot leave home without? Um, I don't, I don't think that I have anything that goes with me every single time. It depends on the trip that I'm going to take and what the weather is going to be like. I know that if it's going to be really cold and I know that it's going to be damp, more than likely, I will probably take the Aero Stitch suit, which has been absolutely incredible. And I couldn't believe my luck when I like won it off of a contest because that suit is worth like $1,200. And then I will just layer up underneath of it. And it makes it a super versatile suit because I can just keep on bulking up underneath of it and not worry about it just getting too tight um, as I add layers, which is super awesome. So it's really versatile and it's really great for when it's going to be colder and it might be damp because it's totally 100% waterproof. I don't have to worry about stopping and putting on like, uh, frog togs or whatever kind of waterproof layer that I have to put over top. And it's just kind of like a worry-free system. It's not super great for hot weather though. It kind of becomes an oven because there isn't a whole lot of vents involved. <laughs> When, in the summertime, I know I'm just going to run around and I know that if it's going to rain, it's just going to be like a light sprinkling or something like that and um, it will survive it is my Scorpion um, Yosemite suit. I believe that's what it's called. It's two pieces. I've got the pants and the jacket. Um, I replaced all the armor in it. It's all D3O now because it comes with this CE armor that's really stiff. Um, and it comes with three different layers on the inside that are removable, which is awesome. Uh, it's super well ventilated. It comes with kind of the Scorpion's proprietary version of Gore-Tex um, as like the, wa the water resistant layer and then um, kind of an insulation layer on the inside, um, which are all separate. So you can have the insulation layer separate from the waterproof layer. Um, which is super awesome, and it's been a really great suit. Uh, it's probably not going to survive the long haul. I've had it for about a year, and stuff is starting to break. Same thing on Carl's jacket. Like, stuff is starting to fall apart on it. But in the year that I've had it, it's taken quite a beating. So I think anybody who's going to do some normal riding that's not going to go through all the abuse that I throw at my gear, it will probably last quite a while. <laughs> So one of the themes that tends to come up in your videos on your journeys, it's the element of human kindness. And by this, I mean, you've had strangers help you down a mountain when you broke your wrist. You've had a gentleman that let you stay in his shop while your bike was needing repairs. What's been the most memorable encounter that you've had as a whole while you've been out traveling? Like my superpower is that like I can find like the nicest people when I actually need help. Like when I need help and I can't, you know, tackle something by myself or if I hurt myself or if the bike isn't running, my superpower is that I can find people who will help. And they're always the nicest people like ever. Probably the most memorable and the one that like stuck with me the most is um, off of the pilgrimage, which is like, you know, probably a really easy thing to pick off of because so many people rescued me anyway, tangent. Uh, probably the most memorable thing for me that stuck with me the most is uh, the tow truck driver that I met in Lewistown. I had a really, really shit day. I was um, trying to find this ghost town on top of Judith Peak. And for those who don't know, Lewistown, Montana is in the dead center of Montana. Um, it's a little town. It's kind of big for Montana standards. Um, and outside of Lewistown is Judith Peak or the Judith Peak Mountains. And there are supposed to be like two or three ghost towns there that I had read about in some book somewhere. I didn't really have um, an actual pinpoint marker for where it was. Part of the rules for the pilgrimage was that I wasn't allowed to use GPS. So I was just trying to find it by ear. And uh, I went up the back side of Druth Peak, um, which I later found out was not the only way to get up there. The harder way, obviously, because that's just what I do, evidently. <laughs> that's part of the journey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I got to the top of this mountain. By the time that I got to the top of the mountain, I had dumped my bike four times. And I had to take everything off the bike to pick it up because Lazarus is not a light baby. I got to the top and my bike totally ran out of oil and wouldn't start, period. And, of course, the top is a dead end which I found out the hard way. <laughs> 
and uh, like tears running around my face like I just like walked down the hill just you know hoping that I would find somebody and I walked for about an hour and a half and I met some kid in a jeep that you know we went back to my bike we tried to jump start it it wasn't working so I got him to take me into town to find a tow truck and the first guy that I called didn't even answer the phone and uh, the kid that picked me up was like oh well Hanser is repoed my truck the other day so maybe they can help you and I'm like it's kind of weird <laughs> okay whatever <laughs> and uh, I called up Hanser's and Martin answered the phone and uh, I didn't know at the time but Martin has had like such a huge impact on my life um, and uh, he was like, oh yeah, I can come help you, but I have to help this like woman with her gas problem first. And I was like, okay, cool. If you wanna pick me up at your shop, I'll go with you and then we can go up the mountain to get my bike. And he's like, cool. So he went back to the tow truck shop to pick me up and I rode with him um, to go take care of this woman in her car. And by the time that we had started up the mountain to go get my bike, it was getting dark and uh, he was in this big rollback tow truck going off-road to go get my bike. And uh, we were like, this is probably not the smartest idea. <laughs> Maybe we'll go up and get it tomorrow. And I was like, okay, cool. But I left everything on my bike. All of my camping gear, everything was on my bike. The only thing that I took with me was my wallet and my phone and my camera. And I had like no money at that point. Like I did the pilgrimage on fumes. <laughs> So uh, I didn't have enough money to go get a hotel or anything and I told him that and like all my gear was on the bike and he's like, it's okay, you can just stay at the shop with me. You can sleep in the big rig, it has a sleeper. And I was like, okay, thank you. <laughs> and he bought me dinner, he bought me breakfast the next day, he let me take a shower at the shop. They had a shower for some reason. And the next morning after we had breakfast, we went up the hill and we got my bike. And um, on the way down, he was asking me if I had roadside assistance through my insurance or anything like that. And I was like, no. And he's like, it's okay. I will file the thing for the next day. You call your insurance company, get roadside assistance now. And I won't tell them that it was off road because if it had written on the receipt that he had got my bike off road, the to like the tow bill would have been twice what it was. And just this man was so incredible. <laughs> And he let me stay at the tow truck shop like another night because it took me all day to figure out what was wrong with the bike um, and then to get the oil into the bike and we had to recharge the battery again. It was like a whole thing. And I got to go on a run with him. We uprighted a dump truck together, which was super cool. <laughs> and afterwards, like I got the address and I started just like writing him letters. And uh, I wrote him letters like almost every month up until a year or so ago. Um, and he's not there anymore. He went and worked for a big rig company in Nevada. And uh, I think that I got the address wrong and I just haven't heard from him since then. Um, but I think about him all the time because like I've never experienced somebody like so selfless in my whole life. <laughs> never asked for anything from me. When I like offered to like give him money for like letting me stay at the tow truck shop, he like he absolutely refused. Um, yeah, he was just incredible. <sighs> <laughs> it is, but it makes you feel good. It's kind of it's it's nice to know that it, no matter how bad things get, there are people like that still in the world, and they're still making differences like that in someone's life. And it's good to have those stories, especially with just everything else going on in the world right now. But you do have a superpower of finding them. <laughs> Yes, I do. Yeah. My mom my mom will say like, well, I'm not worried about you. You always seem to find the people who will help anyway. <laughs> That's a good superpower to have. It could be yeah. worse. <laughs> <laughs> so traveling solo, it can be pretty awesome. And it can also be pretty intimidating for anybody that hasn't done it or doesn't have the experience. Uh, maybe they haven't had to encounter the unknowns like you've had to on your journeys or maybe it's just maybe some self-doubt as to how they would handle it. What are some things that you have learned along the way that might help out another writer that's just getting started or maybe is a little curious on how to get going on maybe taking their first long adventure? I think um, my biggest tip is to try to do dry runs, which is like where you pack everything that you think that you're gonna take on your trip and you act like you're gonna be gone forever but you only do like one or two days and within a hundred or so miles of your house. 
or 200 miles in some cases, um, just so that you can stretch your legs, get an idea of what all that weight is gonna feel like on your bike. And um, if, especially if you can get a chance to camp somewhere and use that setup and then you realize things that you're not going to use and the things that you forgot. <laughs> Do this like two or three times before you do a big long trip. That's like my biggest recommendation. My first thousand mile trip on Lazarus was like two or three months after I got my bike. Um, but before I did that, I did like three or 400 mile trips from home. And uh, it was in close enough that I knew that if something went wrong with the bike or if I needed something urgently, my grandpa could come and help me. Um, being able to like deal with those small emergencies that you're going to have on your first couple trips um, within a range that family can come and help you is really great. <laughs> Mine was kind of cheating like my first thousand mile trip was because I went from Portland, Oregon where I had family to Montana where I had family. So at no point was I too far away from home to have help come and get me if I needed it. After doing that a couple times you just kind of like stretch your legs, your wings kind of get out a little bit wider and you're like, I wonder where that is. And like going a little bit farther doesn't seem so scary anymore. Um, because once you do that one or two times, like you're like, oh, it's fine. It'll be okay. It starts empowering you the more that you do it and the more that you sort of experience it. And it's, it's just like pushing the boundaries of your comfort zone in a way. Yes, absolutely. So if there were no any things to hinder you, distance wasn't a problem, money was no object, what would be your dream ride and on what bike? I feel like I'm cheating because I answered this in my Q&A, but so I already know. <laughs> um, if money was absolutely no object and I could do anything that I wanted, I would ride in China because then I would have enough money to pay an escort because you have to have an escort when you ride in China. Um, and I'd be able to, you know, rent the bike while I'm there because importing a bike into China is an absolute nightmare. And even if I had a ton of money, I just would not want to deal with like the time and effort of importing my bike to China. <laughs> but yeah, no, absolutely. Number one, riding in China. Number two, probably Mongolia. And then number three, Bolivia. <laughs> I can't imagine trying to import anything into China, like vehicle oh, yeah, wise. No. <laughs> I know importing into the US is challenging enough and yeah, I can't imagine going in going out like that. Like most other countries, because I've done a lot of research about this because I'm obsessive and in the winter time, I have a lot of time on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like getting your bike into most countries is pretty simple. Like some of them require a carnet, which essentially says that you're importing the vehicle, but you're not going to sell it while you're there. And then you get a stamp saying that it went out with you. Um, that's the most simplified version that I can to like say on that um, and then some countries don't even require a carnet they're just like oh, okay you're here yeah sure but china no but not so much no it's a little bit more complicated so we're gonna do rapid fire questions i'm gonna ask the questions i just want you to respond with the first thing that comes to mind so the first thing what is your favorite book harry potter nice All right, what is your favorite musician? It could be a musical band, singer, doesn't matter. Kina Grannis. And what is your favorite meal? Spaghetti. Yes. <laughs> Carbs. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I want to thank you again for doing this. This has been a lot of fun. Again, I'm going to have all of the links for her channel down in the description, as well as links to uh, other things such as Redbubble, Patreon, if you guys want to support her. The links for that are going to be down below as well for you to click on. And that is going to wrap this one up. All right, thank you guys for watching and take care. Thanks so much to Motor Carrie for letting me be on her channel and making me a part of this awesome series that she's doing. Make sure that you guys like and subscribe because she's awesome and I'll see you later. <laughs>